How do you respond to an invitation from God to join him where he is working on earth today? I mean, is that a foreign concept to you? Is that something that you are um, learning to, uh, to respond to? I know uh, as we have over the last couple of years really uh, encouraged you to, to be a part of the blessed rhythm where every day you wake up and you begin in prayer. You kind of go through the, the acronym B, believe, begin in prayer. Uh, L, listen. Uh, e, eat with somebody. Uh, build relationships. Serve and share. And that, that whole idea of beginning the day in prayer is, is understanding that God is already at work and I am uh, surrendering myself in a, to a place where I am uh, wanting to join him in the work that he's doing. God, I, I want you to, to help me listen to people. Help me to listen to the Spirit's prompting. Uh, that, I know for me that's just been a powerful thing of, of helping me stay in a daily walk with Jesus that uh, has been pretty exciting. Well, we're in Mark uh, chapter 8. We're halfway through the study of the book of Mark. It's 16 chapters, and today we find ourselves in chapter 8. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and start turning there. Uh, and uh, just kind of a little background, Mark, uh, you know, Jesus is, is really, Mark is really unpacking the life of Jesus in a very uh, kind of simplified way. But he is sharing how, uh, how Jesus is the, the, uh, the Messiah. And so Jesus has been working on earth and, and here he is, uh, he's halfway through his ministry. I mean, he's, he's been serving in Galilee and all these miracles and people have been coming and listening and hearing. And uh, it's been a, a great journey to see how God deals and works with people. And so Jesus is, is wrapping up his Galilean ministry and he's getting ready to start his ministry down in uh, Judea. And he's been working here around the, 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 the Sea of Galilee and a lot of his ministry was there. A couple weeks ago, uh, Drew was talking about how that he went up to Tyre and Sidon and uh, up in the Gentile area and began to do some ministry up there. And instead of when he came back going across and doing some ministry on, on the east side of Jordan, he actually uh, went around and came into that area that we are landing today, right there in the south east side of the Sea of Galilee. It's a kind of a, it's, it's called a Decapolis. It's a place where there is uh, a lot of Gentiles. And so uh, Jesus, ha- as he's at this point, he's, up, he's about one year away from completing his ministry. He will be crucified about a year from now in this story and uh, rising again. And he has one more year and it's very critical what Jesus is focused on is to develop these disciples for ministry that they will have after he is gone. And so here's where our story begins in Mark 8, 1. In those days when again a great cloud, a crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. Now this isn't a crowd that is gathered who are homeless. This is a crowd of gathered that have heard of the miracles and have learned of Jesus and they have come to the desert where Jesus is and have over the days have the, the crowd has, has gotten larger and larger. I believe most of the people came with some food but as they stayed, maybe they stayed longer than they had anticipated because there, there was just something just absolutely uh, magnificent to be around Jesus and to uh, just be enamored by him, his words, what he was doing, who he was. And uh, I think, you know, uh, some of us can relate to having some kind of a project that we were so uh, into that we would maybe miss a meal or two uh, just because we need, really wanted to get that done and we didn't want to interrupt that with food. And I think in some respects, these people were, were there. When it was time to go home, they continued to stay and uh, because it was such an a important time to be with Jesus. And it says that Jesus had compassion on them. He, he saw the crowds that were, were hungry, both physically but also spiritually, and he was meeting their need. And he had compassion on them, and they had been there for three days. So uh, he talks to his disciples and says, and if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them will have, have come from afar. 
And the disciples answered him, how can we feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? So Jesus is, uh, he's going to feed these people. And it's like the disciples are, are shocked to hear what Jesus uh, is asking. And it's, it's kind, of, kind of interesting because only a few weeks ago, uh, chapter 6 of Mark, they were feeding 5,000. And, and so it seems like, did they so soonly <laughs> forget that um, this, is, this has happened before? And so uh, how can we feed these people with bread here in this desolate desolate place. Again, there was no place to get food. It was, uh, if God didn't do something, if Jesus didn't do a miracle, then uh, we were all going to be hungry. And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. I don't know where they got those. The last time they had the, the story, um, they didn't know how many. They, were, uh, they, they went off and searched and found five loaves and, th- and a few fish. This time they were quick to the answer, it looked like. And he directed the crowds to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and he gave them to his disciples to set them before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish that they discovered. And having blessed them, he said to them also, uh, should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And they were, there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. So here's, so Jesus is, uh, is asking the disciples, how many, how many, what do we have? What are the resources we have? And they bring seven loaves and, and a few fish. And, and Jesus breaks the bread, prays over it, hands it to the disciples. And the disciples are then given the task to feed the people with what God had provided. And uh, 4,000, just a few weeks ago, it was 5,000 plus um, in, in. So here it is again. And I, the point I want to, bring out in this is, is Jesus invites his disciples to join him in his work. Jesus decided, you know, he, 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 he was this miracle working God, had done so many miracles, and he could have just spoken uh, and provided food, but he invited the disciples to be a part of this. He, uh, he asked them how many, uh, I, I mean, as he, as he uh, shared the problem with them. He let them wrestle with it. They, they, they looked at this problem and, and it was an overwhelming problem. How can we feed these people in this desolate place? They were like, there is no way that we can do this. And uh, there, it was an overwhelming problem. And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. He said, bring them to me. And then he broke the bread, handed them out, gave them, uh, let them bring it to the people, and then everybody was satisfied. Everybody had enough, so much so that there were leftovers, and they, the disciples, collected those as well. But this idea that God invites us to join him in his work, and when God invites us to join him in his work, it's always God-sized. It's God-sized, it was God-sized here. And when you look at uh, the story of God and his work, it's, he invites us to, to a, a fascinating journey. I, I know that is true with me. I can remember um, when I started being a part of family church. I was, um, I stepped out of some ministry for a while. I went back to the marketplace and God began to work in my heart and I began to wrestle with him about uh, following what his next step was. And I had been praying about uh, bringing a group of people and seeing where God would lead and, and developing a group of peop- people who were following Christ. And uh, I can remember coming to family church one Sunday morning and sitting up in, uh, kind of in, the, in the, the balcony and looking over as people were coming in. And, and one by one, I saw people that I had been praying about who were here and they, had, they, were, they were beginning to come here to family church uh, and, and God just prompted me and said, Ed, look, what, look who I've drawn you to. 
joined me in where I'm at work. And it was that process that I decided to start coming to family church. I came on staff and was here about five years on staff. And then um, I began to get restless with uh, what God was doing and, and if I should stay or go, opportunities that maybe God had elsewhere. And I can remember, uh, you know, through a very difficult time just wrestling with God over that. And uh, it was uh, at that time that I, I just went to prayer and uh, and I remember it was, I was being, it was the transition of me becoming lead pastor. And in that time, I, uh, I, I just felt the move of God saying, Ed, stay, don't go. Stay, I've got work here. I still have work here for you to do. And while I'm wrestling with that, I just think, I go, but God, that is, it's, it's overwhelming. It's just too big. No, I, 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 no, I can't do that. It's not for me. And he's, it, it was, <laughs> and God just said it was God-sized. In a God-sized problem, faith is required. And I made this deal with God, and, I, and it, there hasn't been a week that's gone by that I haven't thought of it. I, just, I told God, I said, I will sit in the chair of leadership, but I will depend upon you to show up in me every day and work in me and work through me to accomplish the work that only you can do. And that's been a, that's been a great journey for me. Uh, but it was, that was uh, God calling us into God-sized uh, challenges. And my question to you is what God size uh, invitation is God calling you to? You know, sometimes you just feel like, man, I just feel like this is what I should do, uh, but it's too big. No, there's no, there's just no way. God doesn't call you into things you can do. He do- calls you into things that only he can do through you. And he puts a heart, and he puts a passion. And sometimes we, for myself, I just sat for years just thinking, well, I, yeah, but I would never step out by faith to walk in that God-sized reality. We have a, a vision here at Family Church that as a church, we, should, we are called to reach Douglas County and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a God-sized assignment. And faith is required, you doing your part, me doing my part, all of us doing our part, and seeing God saturate our county and the world with, Jesus, with the, the great news of Jesus Christ. So here, they've been invited to this journey. And once, uh, once the feast is over, they immediately get into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of the Malthia. And so they're crossing over to the west side of the Sea of Galilee to, uh, to do some more ministry. And it wasn't a great crowd of, of hungry spiritually people who met him. It was a group of Pharisees and the religious people that heard that he was coming and they wanted to meet with him. And, it, and the and it's a very different, it's a very different uh, group of people. So then the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Look at that. They came arguing. They didn't come seeking. They didn't come asking. They didn't come learning. They came arguing and testing, uh, wanting a sign. And, and I, I, you know, as you read that, you go, what in the world are they looking for? I mean, Jesus has done miracle after miracle. And they have watched, they've heard, they've experienced, they've seen, they've been a part of seeing what God has done. What, was, what is that about? And Jesus responds, he just deeply sighed. He, he had compassion with the first group. This, they're not so much compassion here, he's frustrated. He sighed in the spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to you to this generation. Yeah, just across the, the lake, he was giving and feeding 5,000, just had compassion, just overflowing and, and, and satisfied to this people, they were coming with arguments and, and tests. We don't see Jesus arguing with them. He just kind of makes a blank statement. No, you're not getting any sign. So what was this really all about? So what it really comes down to is these, these Pharisees who had been students of the scriptures all their life and knew um, God's word very, very clearly, knew a Messiah was coming, but when the Messiah came in Jesus, they didn't believe. 
So when they see the miracles that Jesus is, is doing, they're not believing this is from God. They believe this is, the power is from Satan. They don't believe Jesus has the authority. So they're asking Jesus to prove with greater authority in a way that is gonna make them believe that he truly is from God the Father. And Jesus said, no, I'm not gonna do it. In fact, he goes on and uh, in, in the same story in Matthew that's, that's talking about the same, he kind of goes into a little more detail and, and says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, Jesus said, but no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. And if you look in, in, uh, in Matthew's uh, gospel in chapter 12, he talks about what that might be. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So basically Jesus say, no, there's no sign for this generation except for the sign of Jonah, which means that in a year from now, I'm gonna be crucified, I'm gonna be buried, and I'm gonna be resurrected in three days, and, I, and you will prove that I am from God. And all that will follow in the church being planted and all that goes on, you will be, it will be undeniable of who I am. Many believe in God and his word, but reject Jesus. Many believe in God and his word and, and, and reject Jesus. I, you know, I think of these, these Pharisees. Um, they were biblically literate, but spiritually blind. They, were, they would follow the principles, but they had no power. They, uh, they, just, they just missed it. They did not understand who Jesus was. Years ago, I was 17 years old, and uh, a young man came to uh, stay with us for a very short time. He, uh, his parents were followers of Jesus. They were at a, uh, they were committed to church, and this young man grew up in church, but he's kind of headed wayward, and so came up to Oregon to, uh, to stay with my family for, for a short time to see if maybe he could find himself. And uh, I can remember uh, while he was there, there was, there was a particular day in, uh, I might, might have been late spring, April, May, and it was kind of, kind of interesting that in this day, it was uh, all of a sudden it got cold and uh, started raining and the rain turned to snow and it was kind of out of season for that, for that rain, uh, for that snow to be at this time of the year. And so um, at dinner table that, that night, uh, Dan, the man, young man's name, uh, shared how that, you know, he's just standing on the deck and looking out and just praying to God, saying, God, if you really real, would just make it snow. And I, you know, I hear that, I, I think man, that's kind of a ridiculous prayer. God doesn't have to do that, does it? He's proved himself in so many ways. And, and, uh, and yet here on this kind of a interesting day, it snowed and it didn't snow weeks before, it never, it didn't snow later. It was just this one day, this one point for a very short time, snow came down and, and, uh, and then it quit right off. And uh, so I think about the story of Dan. If you asked him today, if he knows that God exists, is, 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 God, is God real? He would say yes, he, would, he could, you know, I saw, I prayed and he said, and it snowed but he's not a follower of Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, walk with, with God. He doesn't listen. He doesn't, he doesn't um, have any desire to surrender himself and walk under the leadership and the guidance of God. But he knows that Jesus, that, that God is real and, and knows the story of Jesus. And so many people think, if I just see the... The Pharisees said, if I just, if you just prove, Jesus said, no, I've, I've proved. I proved it. It's a sad story, the, the, the story of the, of the scriptures that God created the world and put mankind in this beautiful garden and walked daily with them every day. 
He dwelt with his people in the tabernacle, made a covenant with them and rose up this nation and said, I'm going to be your God. You can be my people. And uh, he dwelt among them in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And Jesus walks on earth and he's right there in these leaders, these spiritual religious leaders, right there in their presence. And he doesn't see God, he sees Satan. They, they don't see who God is. And whether it be in the garden or whether it be in the nation Israel or whether it be Jesus standing in front of people, they would not believe they rejected Jesus. And how many today, even though we go to church and we uh, read our Bibles and we uh, we have this understanding of who God is and who Jesus is, that many people follow the rules, but they miss the Savior. We stake, we want to be obedient to what the word of God says, but we don't, but we miss the, the daily day presence of Jesus with us. My question to you is, are you walking in a daily surrendered relationship with Jesus that's getting sweeter and getting closer and that, that, uh, that he is, he's, uh, he, you just know he's right here with me? Or is it more, you're just following the rules? Very much the way the Pharisees were. We got one more story as he leaves them and uh, got into a boat again and went to the other side. So he's headed towards the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, and a great problem arises, in, especially, especially in the mind of the disciples, and a great concern comes across the heart of Jesus. It says, now they had go- forgotten to bring bread. Uh-oh. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. I think Jesus was still pondering these this, these. Pharisees and religious people that had, that had come to argue and test him. Uh, and just his sorrow that this, the rejection that when, when the power of God is right in front of them, that, that, they, would, uh, that they would reject them. And that he, his concern was with, with those disciples with this leaven, this leaven is kind of a fermented process of, of bread that you put just a little bit of, of uh, leaven in, a little bit of yeast in, and it changes the loaf. And it's often a, kind of a metaphor in their time of, of, of sin. And, it, and what Jesus is looking at is their unbelief. That's this little bit of unbelief. They had the scriptures, they had the story, they had, they had the understanding of God, they had the truth. But the, the leaven of unbelief brought them to the place where Jesus, the presence of God is standing in front of them and they would miss it. He has one year left to help these disciples understand and not become a Pharisee. That they don't, come, they don't reject God like they did in the garden. They, they didn't reject him like they did in, the, in the, the nation Israel. That they won't reject him like the Pharisees. He has one year left. Will they continue to forget that they have experienced the miracles of Jesus? Will they so quickly forget that they even fed 5,000 and, and, and just yesterday they were feeding 4,000 and they were, seemed to be lost in that? Will they respond like all history, forgetting that I will be with them um, today and forever, that I am presently with them? Have they forgotten that? Will they worry about the temporal things more than the spiritual things? Will food and possessions and security be more important to the mission of impacting their world with the, the message of Jesus? Jesus was concerned 
And when Jesus, when Jesus makes that statement about leaven and the bread and cautioning them, beware of the leaven, they missed it. Totally missed it. And Jesus was aware of, of this and, and, and that they were discussing, what are we going to do? We don't have enough bread. And Jesus answered and said, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Really? We fed 5,000 plus. We fed 4,000 plus. Jesus can, can take one loaf. He took seven loaves and fed over 4,000. He'll take one loaf and we'll be fine. Do, he's, so this next statement is pretty powerful to his disciples. Do you yet perceive or understand are your hearts hardened? Have your, have, having eyes do you do not see and having ears do you do not hear? And do you not remember? These are words that the disciples, if they have any memory, <laughs> would have heard Jesus telling those Pharisees and those religious people that they would be... Uh, they would not understand, they would not perceive, they would, their hearts were hardened, they were, their eyes were, uh, would see things, but they didn't really understand what it meant. But Jesus had spent a whole year and a half with these disciples, helping them understand what they needed to know. Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves, for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? 12, they said. And seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? And the question I have for us. Do you see Jesus for who he really is? A lot of people say they're, they believe in Jesus. A lot of people say they're following Jesus. But Jesus is a, is a distant figure who is way somewhere out there uh, who is, in a, is a story in the Bible, but there is no presence of God in them. Do you understand who Jesus is, that he lives in you, and that when we are in anxiety and when we are in worry and when we're in doubt and we're worried about food and bread and, and Jesus is saying, hey, I'm right here. I'm right. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm right here. And as we walk in this journey with God, what he has offered is a, is a life daily with him. He, Christ is in us. Jesus was walking with the disciples and he was walking in front of the Pharisees and they didn't see and the disciples often was blind. And often we are blind to the fact that Jesus is right here with us. If the disciples were so quick to forget what Jesus was done and they were there with him and experiencing it, how much it is for us to forget. I tell you that, you know, to be outset that I have, you know, been practicing this rhythm of, of beginning in prayer. And I can tell you so many times that I've gone into, you know, the first hour or so of the day and I go, oh, I'm living my life and I haven't had that prayer to say, God, I want to join you in your work. And if I don't pray that, I'm not looking to join him. I'm looking to do my own thing, often maybe for God. But when I'm not walking in that spiritual place, I, I'm not experiencing the fruit of the spirit of love. I don't feel the un overwhelming love of God. I don't feel the joy of Christ. I'm burdened. I'm weighted down. I'm trying, I may be trying to do good things. And I definitely don't have peace.
We are, uh, we are privileged like never, never before in the story of God to have the opportunity to place our faith in Jesus and invite him to be a part of our lives and then be invited every day to live in relationship with him. And last week, we had a great time at the park and our, our uh, uh, pastors, uh, Drew, or excuse me, um, pastors J- uh, Jason and, and Craig were sharing the v- vision and the direction of where God is calling us and uh, shared this, this picture of the church. And Jason said it a couple of times. He says, the, the church is not a place, it's not a building, it's not a meeting The church is the people of God, filled with the Spirit of God, fueled by the power of God to accomplish the mission of God. That's what we are called to do. That's what we said yes to when we asked Christ to come into our lives. That's what we are being invited to every day, to let, as people of God, to be filled with the Spirit of God daily, to enjoy the power of God that will help us accomplish what God wants to do on earth today in your in your family in your neighborhood in your workplace in this county in this state in this world are you do you understand do you understand that this is the mission that we've been invited to the most exciting thing we could be doing on earth and what will you do about that Have a great day. See you next time. So as you ponder this message, uh, there are a couple questions I'd like to ask about. uh, As you are a part of the church, as you are a follower of Jesus, if you're not, this would be a great day to to just surrender and say, Jesus, I want to be part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of your uh, church, your family. And today I, I want to, uh, to uh, just pray a simple prayer to ask Christ in, into your life and in, invite Christ in to you. And we would love to um, be able to connect with you. Just let us know on a connect card, email us, let us know that you made that, that decision. But I just, um, the first question is Jesus wants to do much in you and through you Do you understand? Jesus wants to do much in you and through you. Uh, As as you hear that, as as you read that, what what is that? What do you feel? What do you, is that that an exciting statement? As you consider that, what is the greatest barrier to following Jesus every day? What's the greatest barrier to, to starting your day every day and just open up that, big, that first step of the, of the blessed rhythm. Begin your day in prayer. God, you're already at work. I want, I want to join you today in what you're doing. What's the barrier? Is it, I just don't make time. I, I just am too busy. I, I, whatever. Consider the fact that that today you have the opportunity of walking this earth in your home, your neighborhood, workplace, in the world, in the presence and the power of Jesus, or you feel like you're walking alone with a burden before you. The, the choice is yours. God is wanting to do incredible work in you and through you. And we want to be a part of that to encourage you and join with you in seeing God do uh, amazing work at Family Church. Let me pray. Father, we are grateful for the story and the, uh, of, of, of Jesus and just the, uh, the life that we see you live. We're encouraged that uh, when we kind of lo- get sidetracked, we understand that even your disciples Uh, who were walking with you missed it often and often they didn't understand. And I pray, Father, that as we, uh, as we, as we start uh, this day, as we start 
tomorrow and each day that, God, we would start with inviting you uh, to be a part of us, that we would step into your invitation for you uh, to do in the world and we would join you. And I just pray, God, that, that you would uh, guide and direct all of your followers to accomplish uh, to this week what you desire to do in their lives, in their homes, in their neighborhoods. And we want to give you honor and glory and all the credit and praise for what you are doing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.